Well, welcome to Book Flipper, Mary Pallant. You're the you. uh, a staff writer on the New York Times? No, oh, I'm so freelance, sorry. yeah. That's cool. You write for the New York Times. That's right. very cool. And you've right. also written in the past for the Wall Street Journal. Uh, you would work at New York Magazine. Yes. And you have your first book out. It is The Monopolist, and it's the secret history of the Monopoly board game. Yes. <laughs> it's exciting. Uh, so thanks for taking the time to talk with me. Of course. Um, gosh, uh, you know, where did you dive into the book? I know you were covering the Monopoly World Championships. Is that right? Is that how you started? So all I came across the story totally by accident. In 2009, I was working at the Wall Street Journal and I was writing a lot about business and the economy, which in 2009 was really depressing. <laughs> and um, when I grew up, I always loved games and puzzles. And I thought I would have like a throwaway anecdote about Monopoly being invented during the Great Depression because I thought, oh, you know, for real estate is ironic, great. So I started to look around for the story and the journal and the times, both are places where everything needs to be bulletproof. Like you, you have to get it right. That's like, that's your mission. That's a quaint and, idea. Yeah, exactly. A quaint idea in media today. And um, I was really frustrated. I couldn't find the story. I thought that was going to be the easy part of the reporting. And I came across Ralph Onsbach and his lawsuit. And I you know, reached out to him on a whim and I said, hey, you know, I'm a reporter at the journal. I'm trying to find out the truth about Monopoly. And he immediately got back to me and said, oh, I know all about this. And just started talking and talking and talking. And so I originally wrote a story about him and his lawsuit, which then became a book proposal, which then became the book. You've been writing for a number of years. And so how did you know this was the book? I'm sure you were thinking, what's going to be my book? I want right. to do a book. You were like, should it be about, you know, bringing fencing to inner right. city kids? Because <laughs> maybe that's more of a, a, a YA novel. Should it be about... The longest tennis match in history. Right, right. You know, it's funny. I actually, um, I always loved writing and I always read voraciously as a child. And I've always loved books. I've always owned books. They've always been a huge part of me. But um, fiction and nonfiction. But I was not one of those writers that said, I must do a book. I was really thrilled doing newspaper work. I still love doing, you know, I, I do a lot more narrative, long form feature stories. But I really like the gratification of doing, especially in 2009, doing breaking news when the economy was collapsing was... I mean, there was a lot that was really rewarding about that. I felt like I was learning so much every day. So the idea of doing a book wasn't something that I was obsessed with. And I didn't, I never thought about what my first book was going to be or anything because I didn't know if there was going to be a first book. And there's so many people, especially now with journalism being the way it is, who have these incredible careers who never do a book or do a book after they retire or, you know, whatever it may be. So um, when I, when I started researching this, one of the big questions I had was, is this a magazine article? Is it a book? Is it a this? And then as, as soon as I started getting deeper into Ralph's files and the lawsuit and then Lizzie McGee and her story, I thought, you know, this needs to be fully told or not told at all, basically. Right, because you're promoting the book uh, like any smart person, you're pulling out <laughs> excerpts and you're, you're, right. you're giving them to different websites and you're doing interviews. And uh, it's kind of amazing. I mean, history buffs have a little excerpt about how Monopoly helped win World War II because they smuggled right, right. maps and things to prisoners of war. There's a section for people who love finance about how Monopoly began as anti-Monopoly. Right, There's right. a section about feminism. There's a section about, you know, patents and copyrights. And it really covers right. a whole range of areas. So right. you have to realize it's pretty rich territory. Yes, and I think that um, with an article or a book, you always want to know way more than what ends up in the book. And the original draft, I remember, and for me the challenge was structuring and taking all this material and making it um, coherent because it felt very unwieldy at times, um, a, a lot of the times actually. So um, the original draft I worked on, I, I don't even think I sent this to Bloomsbury, but it may have been like 180,000 words. I mean, it was like twice as long as what it should have been. And I knew that at the time. That's perfect. And then I kind of thought of it like sculpture where you're trying to like take this block and then make it into like a person. Um, and that was kind of the process from there on out. So the editing for me was very, very challenging. The structure is really complex on this book. You don't right. notice it while you're reading it happily, but it is <laughs> music it, to my ears. <laughs> it, 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 it was a, a must have been a real bear to figure out. And it looks yeah. like to me like you sort of structured it the way you experienced it. Well, Nancy Miller Bloomsbury was huge and she was a brilliant editor to have work on this because she really, we went back and forth on this. And at first when I was reporting, I started by making a timeline. Because, it would, and the timeline ended up going from the Civil War because of Lizzie McGee's father all the way to present day. And because the order of these events was so complicated for me. And I had to figure out kind of where, especially like splicing the Parker game history with Lizzie McGee's story. And then in the 30s, you know, day by day, things become really important. So I started originally with just needing to get the chronology straight in my head. And I may have even filed two different versions of the book at one point, like one that was chronological and one that wasn't because um, I, I was really unsure of what to do. 
And it's funny that we ended up with the version we ended up with, which is the book, this is, is the actually version where you start and you yeah, go back it's and actually back not again. wildly different than I think my original proposal. So it went back and forth and back and forth and around and around and around. So the idea of opening with what you think you know and then the reveal. And we felt like Ralph's story, I mean, one of the criticisms of the book, which I think is fair, has been that how much time we spend on his story versus the history. But I felt like he he uncovered this history and he was, to me, the narrative character driving this and that readers could get into his shoes. Um, and I also really early realized that I had no interest in making this a memoir. Like me reporting this story was not as interesting as Ralph uncovering it. Mm -hmm. And so I felt like a big need to kind of step back. Um, and and someone probably said, hey, let's not start with land tax. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. And I also, that's, you know, interesting you bring that up. I think of the sections we cut the most of, I really talk, I love talking to patent and trademark and copyright lawyers for this book. They were, you know, and I wanted those sections to be robust, but I also didn't want it to be a textbook. Mm -hmm. I think that there is a market for that, but this book I wanted to be broad. I wanted my dad to be able to pick it up. I wanted my you know, nephew who was a teenager to pick it up. I wanted people to be able to access it and not realize that they were learning about this stuff and not realize they were learning about history and business and um, these things that I'm interested in but need to be readable and are so often not. Which is exactly what Lizzie's goal was when she first created her game, right. the Landlord's Game. But let's start off with Monopoly. Uh, you played a lot of games as a kid, obviously. Yes. Big game, how many kids in your family? Just one older brother. One older brother. Yeah. So did he always beat you in games? Yeah, it's well, one of the things I loved about Monopoly is that, because he was five years older than me and a lot bigger, is that I actually felt like I stood a chance. Like this was an arena where I was the youngest, you know, and, and when we played, you know, my parents played, my grandmother played, if cousins were in town, whoever. Um, so it was kind of a core of the four of us and then this kind of rotating cast outside. Um, that's one of the things I really liked about it is that it made me feel like I had an equal seat at the table, which as the youngest child, you often don't feel that way. <laughs> I was the youngest of six. So oh, okay. Very yeah. Tough, very tough. to the choir. Very competitive. But one thing I think is really interesting about Monopoly, and it's sort of puzzling as to why it's so popular, right. uh, is that unlike almost any other game I can think of, you are guaranteed to have an ugly fight when you play Monopoly. Right. I mean, it, it really, you really get, I mean, I just played it with my <laughs> nephews and nieces, and he, I mean, I waited, I waited before I rolled, you know, I rolled doubles, I was on this property, I waited, he was counting up, I waited, yeah, yeah. everybody's looking there, they know what's happening, I, wait, I finally, he looks up, I finally, he's like, oh, I'm like, oh, you know, so it's just, it really, but it really does. You, right. And you would think that might make it a negative game for people. Well, that's what I love about board games in general is that they bring out sides of people that you wouldn't see ordinarily. And so, like, I have game nights here a lot, and, like, it's really fun to bring together people who either know each other well or don't know each other. And you think you know people, and then they turn into these animals, or they, they turn very risk-averse, or, you know, become fans of taking risks, or whatever it may be. Um, and I don't think it's just Monopoly, but I think that's part of the reason why it's really fun. Mm -hmm. And um, the Times just had a story about this was a while ago about how some dating startups are now using board games for first dates because it gives people something to talk about. There's a built-in narrative to a game the same way that there is with sports, right? Mm -hmm. You walk into a basketball game, you know there's going to be a winner and a loser, and you want to know like who's going to be the hero, who's not. Like That's part of why I think sports are so enticing. So even though I mostly write about sports now, people think, oh, board games, that's like totally different. To me, they're like, it's like a nerd sport. Like, it's, you know, it's, yeah, no. it's a narrative, and I think that's part of what makes them captivating. Well, I don't know. People don't punch each other in the face <laughs> over sorry or the game of Well, life. my family, you know, that might, might happen. It might be fair game. So let's start with Ralph. This is a teacher in Berkeley in the 70s, yes. and as you tell in the book, he plays a game of Monopoly with his kids, and right. then that night or the next day, he goes on a bit of a rant about Monopolies. They're terrible, right, they're right, horrible, they're right. awful. And the son says, well, heck, I just want, am I a bad right, person? Right, I just want the right. game. And he goes, yeah, that's a good point. Why the heck do we play a game that celebrates something that's evil? Right, right. And what's funny about Ralph is he creates this game called Anti-Monopoly, which, you know, as its name implies, is Monopoly backwards. So instead of trying to get control of everything and become a monopolist, you're trying to break things apart. And when he creates this game in the 70s, he doesn't know the history of the game. He thinks like everybody, Darrow invented it during the Great Depression. And by making this game, he's actually returning it to its like anti-capitalist kind of edgier roots. But he has which, no idea. Yeah. He has no idea at the time, which is very funny to me. Um, right, and he, and he creates this game and he originally calls it Trust the Bust. R bust the trust, bust right, the trust, right. He which toys is with a few different names. Literally, what it is, and then right. he comes up with the catcher anti monopoly, right? Because he realizes like nobody talks about trust busting the way like, <laughs> they did in Teddy's Teddy Roosevelt's day, unfortunately. And, and he starts to market it locally in San Francisco, is that right? Right. And 
it does really well. I mean, in the second right. year, he's selling a couple hundred thousand copies. That's pretty damn good for a guy that's hand selling his game. Right, and I think that part of, um, you know, a hit in the board game industry is really rare, but I think part of why Anti-Monopoly did so well is, I mean, think about Northern California in the early 70s. You know, this this was a very cynical time, and I think the game really spoke to people then. And uh, one of my other rants is about board games. I think that board games right now are kind of in this place that comic books were in a few years ago, where People didn't see them as artifacts of their time. They didn't see them as these, you know, pieces that can tell us about history and the people that were living in them at the time. And so Anti-Monopoly, I think, like, fits in that tradition. To me, it's such a game of the 70s, you know, <laughs> and of California. And so it really worked. And, and Nixon right. was in Watergate. Everything right, was anti-establishment. Right. It worked right. perfectly. And it was anti-Monopoly. Anti, arguably, the most popular board game of all time, as far as uh, commercial. modern commercial games. Uh, Monopoly or Anti-Monopoly? Uh, Monopoly is. Yes, I think, you know, it's a blockbuster. There's no, Hasbro doesn't um, break out, you know, by game sales, mm -hmm. but I think it's fair to say it's, you know, it's a, it's a huge hit and still, you know, continues to be. You got to go to chess and checkers to sort of yeah. really, and backgammon to really compete with it. Right, and those are in the public domain. So, right. you know, the, the manufacturing implications are different, so. And of course, Monopoly, uh, if we jump back a bit, we're already messing up with the structure of the book. <laughs> <laughs> but but Parker Brothers had great success with Tiddlywinks and Ping Pong. Right. But they found those games slipping out of their control. Right. They sort of became part of the public domain or people could make variations right, on right, it right. that were successful and they're like, ah. And so they have this game Monopoly that literally saved their company during the right. depression and it's hugely important to them. And some guys start selling anti monopoly and they say, Well, that's not cute and they sue it. Right. And and they, you know, like a lot of companies went after people that they felt like were infringing. So because of Ralph's lawsuit, we know that Parker Brothers reached out to the makers of Spaceopoly. Um, there was a priest making a game called Theopoly, <laughs> who also heard from the company. So, um, but that's like pretty normal for a company to try and assert their claim. And actually, courts look at that. You know, if you're trying to defend your mark, did you? How, how consistent have you been? You so it makes to, sense that they would do that, right? Because if you don't, then you've given right, up right, to it. right. And, and also, you kind of want to cover the waterfront. I can see why lawyers at Parker Brothers would say we can't just pick on one guy. You know, that makes a game. We we need to be kind of keep an eye on this whole. Right, that's it's not right. just because it's right. successful. And that's why you'll find right. out that Disney sort of clamps down and puts up a, sends a lawyerly letter to a little nursery school with pictures of Mickey on the side of the building. Right, right. Very similar, yeah. for sure. And so they get embroiled in a lawsuit and it goes on for a long time. It consumes Ten his years. life. Yeah. His wife is ill, but gets ill during the time she ends up, we find out, having MS. It's, it's hard on their marriage. It consumes everything about them, including all their money. Right. And uh, there's incredibly dramatic stuff in this lawsuit, which goes all the way to the Supreme Court. I mean, right. at one point, he find, his son stumbles upon this earlier version of Monopoly. He finds out it looks like Monopoly was not invented by Charles Darrow during the Great right, Depression, right, right. but by this woman called Lizzie Maggie, Maggie, McGee. McGee. And that same day, the lawyer that's been working side by side with him has a heart attack. Right. There's a lot of really dramatic episodes in this, and I think that... Um, you know, a lot of people told me that Ralph's story feels very cinematic to them, that he's, you know, I, I think that when you look at stories and you look at kind of who your main characters are and bad things happen to them, you say, you wonder, like, what does this reveal about them? And I had this question about Ralph and his motives all the time. I thought, like, all these things that happen to them, I know so many people who would drop the lawsuit or they would take the settlement or what have you. And understanding his background as a character was really important to me. I mean, I spent a lot of time interviewing him. And he left um, Danzig, you know, right before the Nazis came in. And he, you know, his family are Jewish, and he came to the States as an immigrant, worked his way through school. Um, and, you know, his son, so he interviewed for the book as well, and um, his late ex wife, Ruth, they said there was always a cause in the house, like whether it was going against the Vietnam War or whatever. <laughs> so, yeah, so the idea that he was going to fight this to the bloody end surprised me less and less as I kind of started unpacking their family and their dynamic a little bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, they discover, hey, Monopoly actually began as anti-Monopoly, exactly right, what right, he thought right. he was taking it to this new level, and it did. And so tell us about Lizzie, because she is influenced by Henry George. Sure. Who, I just read a book about uh, called The Age of Acquiescence by oh. Steve, uh, oh, it's Steve Rowe. Okay. And uh, it's about the last Gilded Age compared to this Gilded Age, and oh, tries to answer the question, why did everybody fight and be embroiled in, in, in arguing over the country and the future right, and the economy right. and, and big business and fat cats and they were the enemy. And today, people just go, oh, well, what are you going to do? And right, right, right. In reading this book, a big figure is, of course, Henry George. Right, and I love history and I love business, but I didn't know much about Henry George before this. I know, I and, right. um, <laughs> and I read Progress and Poverty, which is, it was a blockbuster in his day. It was a huge bestseller. 
And um, it really, I think of George as, you know, to your point, very much a reaction to the amount of wealth that was being created in this country that nobody had seen and it was concentrated among a few people. So The robber barons. Right. And, and, you know, shortly after George dies, you have Ida Tarbell and the history of Standard Oil and you start getting more criticism of this. Um, you get, you know, muckraking journalism and you, you, you get Lizzie McGee and she makes this game. And the idea of using a board game as a teaching tool is not crazy. I mean, Milton Bradley... Um, was a pioneer of the kindergarten movement in this country. And uh, this was before TV, this is before radio. So the idea that this would be like a means of communication totally makes sense. Um, it was almost all that board games did, right? They were all right. educational and edifying and morally Right, right, God absolutely. Help us all, it sounds awful. Well, and Milton Bradley, you know, he popularized the game of life. And if you look at the original board for the game of life, it is so depressing. It is like, <laughs> there's like a suicide square. And, right. and to this point of games reflecting culture, I think that like, that's one of the things I find fascinating too, is that I think we get very nostalgic about board games and history. Mm-hmm. And over and over and over again, I felt like, and, and with Lizzie's story too, like, now is pretty great. Like when you research what it was like to be a female game designer at the turn of the century, I'm like, you know, like 2015, like we have a lot of work, but like, it's not as bad as not being able to vote um, (laughs) or or not having, you know, anybody else at the patent office that's of your gender, you know, it just, the hurdles that were against her um, were pretty extraordinary, which makes, I think the genesis of the game that much more astounding. That's right. So Henry George is a huge national figure. He influenced a lot of people. Churchill, you know, Tolstoy, Churchill. um, Yeah. A lot of people. And one person that he influenced was Lizzie who was a woman and she was very independent for her day. Right. I mean, she's, she's not. <laughs> no, she was a very outspoken feminist. She did this stunt that I talk oh, about in the book where God, she puts this. herself up for auction and um, likens her you know, status as a woman and how she's being paid to slavery. It's like Yoko Ono. It's like this public stunt to, right. to gain attention for an issue. I thought it was fascinating. Which is you know, pretty, pretty out there, even for where the women's rights movement was at the time. And um, she gets a lot of attention for this. So she's out there. I mean, she's pretty bold. And she, a lot of people likened her to Mary McLean, who was this openly bisexual author who, um, you know, and I read her books too, because when people kept referring to Lizzie as that, I was like, I need to understand who this woman is. So you can see how there's like so many tangents to this research and rabbit holes I went down. And um, Lizzie also, she wrote short stories. She wrote poetry. She was involved in theater. And over and over again, these themes of justice and inequality and economics come up. Um, which I thought was really interesting. And she's very much her father's daughter. Her father was uh, a very influential newspaper owner, James McGee. Campaigned with Lincoln. Camp, you know, traveled with Lincoln during the Lincoln-Douglas debates and understanding who he was. And actually, I read through his Civil War letters, um, which are astonishingly cool. still around. And it's really cool to read them because, you know, you get the gloves on. And these people start to become real human beings. Like, they really become... And this was right before Lizzie was born, but he goes back and forth with his wife about what it's like. And just hearing like the tone of how he described things and kind of what his background was, um, was really, really helpful. Yeah. So she is a huge fan of, uh, of George, Henry George. Right. And she says, I'm going to create a board game to popularize the idea of the land, tax, the one tax system right, right. and the ideas of how landlords and people with monopolies are not good. Right. And so she creates this game called the Landlord's game yes and there's two versions right there's the version where you bust up the landlords and you and you are good and you can win the game that way or there's the other version where you become a monopoly and that's how you win the game right sadly that version (laughs) becomes far more popular pretty quickly right (laughs) right so she does this and it really it takes off it does take off it goes viral but like turn of the century style is how i always describe it i mean it becomes a favorite game among like a who's who of left wing America. So Upton Sinclair. Upton Sinclair plays it. Scott Nearing, who was a, a big deal in his time, he had this very um, interesting academic freedom case at Wharton. He was fighting, and um, it, it's played in Arden, Delaware, which is the single tax colony. And you can actually still go to Arden, Delaware, and it's amazing because some of the houses are still there, the cottages. And this is like a utopian society, right? Right. And there was also one in the South. And you know, single tax theory. We don't know about it now, but it really resonated with people at the time. It was a big deal. And I think a lot of these utopias were set up and they started out, Arden at least started out as kind of a summer getaway. And then people started living there year round. And, um, and it traveled by word of mouth. And from there, it kind of goes to, you know, various Northeast colleges. It's a big deal in a lot of fraternities. And it's unclear to us, like Lizzie reduced her patent in 1924, but we don't know how aware she was of just how her folk game had spread. And people start calling it the Monopoly game and localizing it and making it their own. Right, because when we talk about the game spreading, we don't mean people went to the store and bought a copy. Mm -hmm. 
people would make their own versions. They would say, oh, they somebody would have right. the game and say, oh, that's cool, and they would paint a copy for right. them, right. or and they they do everything handmade, and so then they would start to localize it, which is fascinating. And right. uh, I mean, we're used to the idea that like. Uh, I don't know, rummy. There's a 10,000 variations right, on rummy exactly. and card games. But board games, you don't think about variations on board games too much. Right. No, it? no. People don't make board games. I mean, now you actually have this weird, interesting, cool thing with Kickstarter yeah. where people are now able, if you're a game designer, you know, it used to be, it's kind of like book publishing. There were barriers to entry. You know, you needed a big publisher to put you out there. And now if you're a game designer, you can just kind of put things out. You can say, hey, I'm making this game, you know, kickstart me. Um, and, and I think that's very funny because it's almost like a return to like these earlier Monopoly days where people just kind of made their own things. All right, so this woman invented the game and she had other, she had other patents too. She right. had a patent for uh, putting paper through a typewriter right, to right. help it run more smoothly. So she was really unusual for her day. And that was even before her landlord's game patent. That's I mean, right. she would have been not too old when that happened. 24 or something like right, that. Right, pretty she was young. very young. Yeah. And so this game starts to spread and people adapt and it becomes this folk game that spreads around the country to colleges. Right, And right. it ends up, uh, is it too soon to get there? It ends up in Atlantic City. Yes, so the Quakers of Atlantic City are a group that plays the game extensively, and they... Um... First, can I stop you? The Quakers of Atlantic City, <laughs> this is something new to me. I had no idea what the heck. The idea of Quakers, they're supposed to have like no big buttons because that's too much, and they're in Atlantic City owning the big hotels. So Atlantic City's history is fascinating, and anybody who's watched Boardwalk Empire or read the book, or there's another, another fantastic book about the history of Atlantic City called Boardwalk of Dreams by Bryant Simon, and I interviewed him for the book. He was fantastic. And you realize that at that time, it was a melting pot. And with the melting pot, you get, because it's this conduit between, you know, Philadelphia and New York, and it's just this hub, um, you get every ethnic and religious group you could imagine. And actually, some groups really flocked to Atlantic City because there were boarding houses that maybe didn't have dancing or didn't have alcohol or... Like some of the Quaker hotels. Right, they right. They had great so, teas, but they had no liquor. So it became a vacation place where people kind of could find, you know, whatever their respective group was and spend time there. So it actually ended up becoming a big hub for a lot of different ethnicities and mm -hmm. different groups. And uh, it very much, when I read about like the Lower East Side and the history of that, you know, here in New York City, it reminds me of Atlantic City. Like this was like the vacation counterpart of... You know, these like dense neighborhoods that had people, you know, coming in from all over the place, all different faiths, all different, you know, and they all kind of like picked whatever block or whatever boarding house. And um, the Quakers were really interesting in Atlantic City because um, William Price and a lot of these architects who built these really decadent, huge structures Quakers. were Quakers. Quakers yeah. And what they were doing in their public life, they were creating these incredible marvels that are sadly now mostly gone. But when you look at their lives in Arden or, you know, kind of day to day, they were very simple and very modest. It's like a nun designing a whorehouse. I mean, it really, it makes no <laughs> sense whatsoever. Right, but it's it's fascinating to me. And I think that like Philadelphia has a lot of Quaker history too. And, um, and so Atlantic City, you know, I think that we think of it as just this booze filled prohibition era, you know, Nucky Johnson running everything. Um, but, but actually it was really a dynamic place at the time. And Monopoly. Uh, Look at me! I already did it. <laughs> Landlords Trust. Well, were people calling it now on the boards? Now at this point, it was they were writing Monopoly. Right, they? and this comes up in the on spot depositions over and over again. Is you know what did you call it? What did you call it? And over and over again, they say we called it the Monopoly game. We called it the Monopoly game, and he kind of refers to it as Monopoly with like a lowercase m. Mm -hmm. And um, and later now we've learned of boards where Monopoly was actually written on it mm -hmm. before Parker Brothers. So that seems pretty indisputable at this point. This might be the point to pull out the, the board this, just because I, I want to look at the, uh, the, the board itself because sure. there were versions for cities all over the country in a way. Right. And, uh, but we find out Atlantic City for various reasons, one big reason, became like the iconic one. Right. And this is fascinating. I mean, Oriental Avenue, I mean, I just figured there's streets in Atlantic City, but they all actually mean something. Oriental Avenue is where the Asian population was in Atlantic City. Right, and Atlantic City was deeply segregated, and it actually became a place where a lot of um, African Americans who were living in the South, trying to find a better life up North, would come. Um, kind of almost, it reminds me a little bit of like the Harlem Renaissance and this huge migration that was happening. And um, they came to Atlantic City, but unfortunately, it was a deeply segregated place. And they went here. <laughs> right, and we know that because there's a Quaker deposition from Ralph's case where one of the lawyers asks about the board and she said, oh, we had this maid who, you know, worked for us, we loved, and she was black and we wanted her acknowledged on the board. So we put her street on and I thought that was crazy. And then I looked at the, the 1930 census was a huge gift to this book. And I looked through the census records for Atlantic City and sure enough, if you look at the streets of Atlantic City, you know, Baltic and Mediterranean, 
those were very segregated neighborhoods. And those are um, like the lowest rent spots on the board. Right. However, the blacks do have some revenge because kind of like 125th Street in Harlem, some of the best spots on the board are Kentucky. And right, Indiana right. And, 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 and also Atlantic City at the time was a hub for some of the most incredible jazz talent ever. And I'm a big music person, so learning about this was very exciting to me. That um, And there was a lot of integration, actually, that was happening. So um, whether you were black or white, you would go to hear you know, whoever was playing at um, Kentucky Avenue. So if you were going to great food, right. great restaurants, and great jazz, you would go to the Red Board. You would go to yeah, the red spots exactly. on the board. Uh, and um, before we get to my favorite spot on the board, Ooh. what is the single most important slot on the entire board? What's the single one title that matters most? Oh, well, in terms of the lawsuit, Marvin Garden. So when Charles Todd learns the game, and Charles Todd is a man living in Philadelphia, he learns the Quaker Atlantic City version through a friend. And he's in Philly, so he doesn't know Atlantic City well. So Marvin, with if you go to Atlantic City, it's Marvin with an E-N. And uh, he copies the board, but he makes a spelling error. He spells it Marvin with an I-N and doesn't think much of it. And then when Darrow copies that, he copies the spelling error. And Charles Todd later jokes in you know, his uh, deposition that uh, it's one of the most repeated spelling errors in, in history. Because if you think about it, every Monopoly board now, just about, has Marvin with an I-N. So, That's right. Whoops. And I don't know if uh, any, any other boards have anything unusual, but my favorite is, of course, New York Avenue. I'm not sure if all the beige, but New York Avenue yeah. is where you would find male prostitutes. Yes, it was one of the earlier um, gay districts as well, uh, which when you think about kind of the gay rights movement in this country, that was way ahead of the idea of even having like a gay district or gay neighborhood. One of the first um, gay bars in the entire country was right. in, on New York Avenue. Exactly. And also, for whatever it's worth, just from a technical standpoint, this is the best part of the board. Well, that's what I was getting to. I mean, gay gentrification strikes again. <laughs> if you're going to buy properties, you want to buy the beige. Cause right. The they they get landed at. on more often. They're cheaper to build on than Boardwalk and Park Place. Get more and... bang for your buck. For exactly. what you so that's that's where you invest in. Don't put hotels. Put four houses. <laughs> yeah, exactly. A housing shortage. You, you've learned well. <laughs> Did the Quakers know that that was a game? I mean, they, they knew these streets, and they certainly probably knew that was where the jazz clubs were. I doubt they knew that New York Avenue was going to go get male prostitutes, or would they? No, you know, I don't. I, it's unclear. We don't know specifically where the Quakers thought of New York Avenue, but I think that one thing that's important to think of is that when they were making this board, nobody knew that it was going to become of course. the default Monopoly board. You know, actually, if you buy Monopoly today in the UK or elsewhere, they often have like London locations. Oh, yeah. or, but um, Just like it originally did. But, it, but the way that the, the game was played, it was so casual. And so um, one of the Quakers who puts the property values was a realtor. So he did have some sense of what properties were worth there. But I don't think anybody, when they were putting together the Atlantic City board, realized that it was going to be something we'd be talking about. But they knew that that was perhaps where the black people lived. And they knew that was where some nice clubs right, and restaurants right. where I, I just wonder. And uh, Boardwalk was, I mean, when you read about the Boardwalk in Atlantic City in the 20s and 30s, I mean, it was where everything was happening in mm -hmm. the world. You had these decadent hotels. It was a big place for marketing. Um, you had entertainment. I mean, that really was the, you know, the cornerstone of the city for sure. Do we know anything about the other areas? Ooh, a little bit. I mean, a lot of them were residential. Um, Margate and Ventnor was a you know nice gated community, which makes sense why it was down there. Park Place is also very fancy. It was where a lot of the nice hotels are. So it kind of mimics Atlantic City at the time. The railroads were actually huge in Atlantic City. And actually, I think part of Atlantic City's downfall because the railroads were how people accessed the city. And it was very much when Atlantic City was founded in the 1800s, um, this doctor, Pitney, created as a getaway. I mean, because cities at the time were seen as so toxic that, you know, being by the sea was going to be this great thing. So people would come in by um, railroads. And after the war, one of the problems that Atlantic City had is that, you know, why, I mean, technology just changed. Why would you get on a train to go to Atlantic City when you could get on a plane and go to Miami? And um, the hotels, it just wasn't built for cars, which of course was all the rage in the 50s. Mm. So uh, I came across my research. Some of the hotels were advertising free parking, <laughs> which I thought was very funny. Um, and they destroyed a lot of these beautiful structures to put in these like really hideous parking garages and things. So I actually think the railroads were part of the boom of Atlantic City, but also part of what led to, you know, why honestly it still hasn't really ever reached its, um, this is, its I, pinnacle. This is an interesting version. I, I've never seen it look like this. My, my board does not have that uh, logo for the community chest. No, yeah, and this board I bought in 2008 or nine or so. And it's kind of one of the, it's not a, a collector or anything, not, yeah. but it's kind of a throwback a little yeah. bit. Well, there you go. So 
This game had traveled all over the country. It began yes. as the Landlord's Trust, Landlord's Game. Yes. It was taken over, called Monopoly by a lot of people. Yes. They made it local, and this guy, Charles Darrow, took it, and like many people before him, made his own copy and right. took it away, but he did something different. Right, so he sells the game to Parker Brothers, and he actually wasn't the first person to try and market the game on, on his own. Um, but Parker Brothers needs a hit, and so does he. He's hit on hard times, and the game becomes this blockbuster. It's just this huge, huge um, seller for Parker Brothers and for Darrow. And pretty much immediately, the Darrow story of him having created in his basement becomes very tied up with the marketing and the publicity with the game. So, Which was pretty common. Which was, well, sort of. I mean, no game had ever really sold like Monopoly had. And the idea of a game inventor was relatively new and that he became the face of this um, was pretty, was relatively new in the game industry at the time. And so um, the problem that Parker Brothers has is there are all these other versions of Monopoly out there. So they go about acquiring, Dan Lehman was a man who sold finance. Milton Bradley was making a game called Easy Money. There's a man in Texas, Rudy Copeland, who has a game called Inflation. So they go about acquiring these other games, but which includes Lizzie McGee. And they strike a deal with her to acquire the Landlord's game and two other games for $500, no royalties. And, uh, but, and she's really unhappy about this, but by the time the mid-1930s are here, you know, the Monopoly craze is in full force, as is the Darrow story. Mm -hmm. So she, she felt like she had no choice. Did she realize that this game was just copied from her game? Did she pay attention to that level? She does this interview in 1936 with the Washington Evening Star where she says, you know, Darrow just kind of dressed up the game a little bit and she holds up her boards um, and she's not happy with the outcome. So And they're very similar. They're, yes. I mean, when you look at her patent, you can see, you know, she has to go to jail. Instead of free parking, she has public park. She has the railroads. I mean, it's, it it's looks, the core yeah. of Monopoly. So you've played Monopoly, you've yes. played Anti-Monopoly, and you've yes. played the Landlord's Game, I assume. Sort of. I mean, it's it's hard to get a set, um, mm -hmm. and I'm not a game collector, but actually recently I did an event at NYU Game Center where we played the auction version of Monopoly, which is kind of like Landlord's Game, but a little bit before you know Parker Brothers steps in. And it's where it, basically where you play where every property you land on you auction instead mm -hmm. of saying, oh, you're in Tennessee, would you like to buy it? Well, it's very the, confusing. That's the classic <laughs> rules, isn't it? Right, right. And it, it was really fun, but it changes the entire game. And which is, which which do you like the most? Did, hmm. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I, mean I, like, I think it's hard because Monopoly is just so hardwired in us, like how we play. And most people don't read the rules. Like it's a very unusual game in that it's very generational. And I think one of the reasons why this version of Monopoly is so great is that it was product tested. I think some of the changes that the Quakers made made the game easier and simpler, especially for kids. Um, but that said, you know, I think Monopoly, one of the, criticism of the criticisms of the game comes from game designers who say, you know, it's flawed and here's why. <laughs> and I think that's fair, but I also feel like, and I say this over and over again, it's like criticizing a Model T for being a bad car. It's like, well, Monopoly exists, you know, it was great for what it is, and it, or it is great for what it is, and it, um, you know, all these other games have sprung from it, which I think is tremendous. But I wouldn't say it's the best game ever from a design perspective because... I mean, geez, like, you know, it's been around for a century. I think it's done pretty, pretty good. <laughs> so that game becomes a blockbuster. He, he literally becomes famous, Charles Dick. Yes. He's really famous. Yes. yes. Wealthy and famous, famous. People, right. What he does is covered in the press, and that is very unusual. And, and at, at the time, I mean, nobody was rich, really, it felt like. So I think that his story, this idea that he, you know, was the Cinderella, really was powerful to people. Um, it's the Depression. It's powerful at any time, but especially during the Great Depression. And that's part of why the games, the game, board games do well during good times and they do well during bad times. For exactly. lots of reasons. But of course, one thing is you get to play and pretend you have money. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Which, unless you're Donald Trump, most of us don't get to uh, <laughs> throw around real estate money quite as freely. And one, of, well, that's funny money too. But one of the, uh, and one of the other reasons why board games became popular was electricity. Right, and there are a lot of things that happen um, in the American lifestyle. You start hearing politicians talk about the fight for leisure, mm -hmm. and you see playgrounds being built, and um, if you think about child work, labor yeah. laws, and um, things just change, and the way the middle class was changing was pretty dramatic too. And actually, after the war, um, I was very interested in board game sales because it became, Monopoly was around, and it became very popular in the 30s, but when soldiers came back from the war, you know, Monopoly sets became as ubiquitous to suburbia as getting a new fridge and a new car and a this Blender, and that. Yeah. Right. So that's where I think the, you know, after the war, the fact that it kept going on and reminded people of things before was really interesting. Is there any other game that's lasted today that was mm. 
created in a communal fashion the way Monopoly kind of was? Well, you know, Scrabble's history, which I'm not an expert in, but Stefan Fatsos, who wrote Word Freak, is, and it's a fantastic book, talks about word games. And Scrabble, you know, exploded um, in the 50s. And I think that there's a history of word games, too, that kind of made Scrabble possible. Um, and to me, Scrabble is much more of a math game than a word game, but that's another conversation. Um, I think that all games, if you look at them, and I think all inventions, and this was a big lesson for me in reporting this, was, you know, I think we love the light bulb story because on some level, I think we all want to believe that it could happen to us. We could wake up and, you know, here comes the iPhone, you know, out of my head. My or, friend has a card game that he invented. He's trying to sell. Right. You know, that, that you know, I'll, I'll wake up and Moby Dick will just be in my head and I'll be ready to write it, <laughs> you know, whatever it may be. But the truth is that I think most games have, and most creations have whole histories before them. And there's a whole the line of thinking that comes before and that even Lizzie's game and board games in this country, they don't really come from this country. They come from, you know, overseas and Africa and the Middle East and they have these, you know, lineages that are really long. So I don't think that anything just pops up, including the landlord's game. I mean, I think there's elements of that, that, you know, we all stand on the shoulders of the people who create things before us. For example, uh, the little houses, Yes. where do they come from? What country they come from? Ukraine. Well, originally, um, when people were making the games, some people made them modeled after. Um, there was a folk game player who traveled to Ukraine and modeled them after. But the houses and that kind of concept had been around. Uh -huh, but like some college students or people, they would right. bought, they found little houses in Ukraine and said, "Oh, let's use these." Right, right. And I think that that's one of the fun things about the early history of the game is people kind of made it their own. And so you had people using buttons or earrings or whatever for the tokens. And then when uh, Parker Brothers starts making the games. They call on Dallas Manufacturing, this company in Chicago, who is making Cracker Jack prizes. And even those tokens, the ones that we all know, are almost afterthoughts. Like, they just couldn't make these things fast enough. <laughs> and it's funny, if you look at Dallas catalogs, you can see almost the same moldings of some of the tokens that we know, but they have, like, little loops because they were used as, like, charm bracelets and things. So... <laughs> A lot of this wasn't intentional. So the tinkering did not stop after uh, it became a big smash hit, of course, and was uh, popularized right. by Parker Brothers. People, some people put money in the middle, right, some people right. auction, they don't auction. Right. And college students started coming up with their own variation. And, and that's fine if you do it in your home, but they started to have tournaments. And right, right. Um, so there were these two college kids um, who were in Cornell who were also pub published a book called A Thousand Ways to Win a Monopoly. And um, which, by the way, if you're looking for a good book on monopoly strategy, it's great. Um, and they start hearing from uh, Parker Brothers because it was not a sanctioned book. So, yeah, I mean, there, there was a lot of... I was surprised at how much controversy there was around the history of this game. I mean, you think of Monopoly as this very benevolent, <laughs> cheery thing. But actually, I mean, Ralph's lawsuit aside, like there were a lot of people who were upset with how it was all handled. And they got a $10,000 advance to do right, that book. Right. That seems like a lot of money in there. It was a lot of money for them, too. A book about a, a strategy game on a board game? That... Right, right. And they worked on it in their dorm room and... Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty astounding when you think about it. And one of them ended up as a clerk at the Supreme Court. Yes, yes, <laughs> Jeff Lehman. So Jeff Lehman goes on, and he, not only was he clerking um, in the Supreme Court, but he went on to become the president of Cornell University, and now is actually with uh, NYU Shanghai. So he's had a pretty incredible career. And the other guy? Jay Walker, <laughs> who is the billionaire founder of Priceline.com. So he didn't do too bad either, um, which is it's very funny, the whole story to me. And uh, so, the, you know, they're sort of involved in this case that goes all the way to the Supreme Court. We're back to Ralph, who has been fighting for a decade, yes. gone through multiple lawyers. Right. He now has a new lawyer who is also suing another manufacturer because their game, Masterpiece, he right, plays Right, right, right. I mention this because I love Masterpiece and played it as a kid. Oh, oh great, <laughs> I'm sure great, it was great. edifying, but it was a lot right. of fun. Somehow you had Mona Lisa and all these other modern works, classic works of art. Right, and sort of yeah. auctioned them off and fought for them. It was, a, it was a fun game. I've never actually been able to get a copy of it, but I've always wanted to play it. I've been looking for years. <laughs> so he goes all the way to the Supreme Court and is very lucky because they refuse the case. Yes, and so they uphold not just his victory and his right to make anti-monopoly games, but also his version of the story and that he preserves his right to tell the story and talk about the early origins of the game. I mean, a lot of times if you do a settlement, a lawsuit, you're sworn Everyone to, to you know, silence. <laughs> Everyone has to shut up, but um, that's not the outcome for Ralph. So is it a happy ending? I think it's a complicated ending. Um, I think it is in that he, his goal, you know, when he turned down this huge settlement, it became clear to me that it was a matter of principle for him too that he, you know, telling the story was a big part. So for, in that respect, it was definitely a victory, but I think it came at a price. And I think that one of the things that's been funny is that in the last few years reporting this book, I mean, his case ended in 1983. So the Lizzie McGee piece, 
has been out there for a while and game historians knew about it. Um, but I can't tell you how many times people in the last few years, they say, oh, you're writing a book about Monopoly. You must be writing about the guy who invented it during the Great Depression. <laughs> so, I mean, if you like that liar. <laughs> and I, well, and I think it's like funny that like, in spite of all of this, that that story has just really stuck. And, um, you know, it makes Ralph want to pull his hair out because it's not, you know, it just hasn't been the truth for so long. And I'm curious, you know, I don't know what impact the book will have on that, but I think the true story is so much more interesting. When did um, Monopoly stop including that? They used to include that story about Charles Darrow in every copy of the game. Right. Well, it's interesting. The company, you know, over the last few years, and Hasbro acquired Parker Brothers in the early 90s. So a lot of this history happened way before they came into the picture. Um, but even now, it seems like it's selective storytelling. So over the years, it's gone from telling the Darrow story to like just starting the timeline in the mid 1930s or, you know, it's been very coy. Um, popularized. You know? <laughs> right, right. And, um, or the Monopoly brand and, you know, some of this language, I think you have to be pretty on, you know, the story to understand that it's, you know, pretty lawyerly, um, which I think is funny. I mean, I think it's disappointing too, because I think that like one of the things that's been so fun about the book is you hear from people, you know, you kind of go into your rabbit hole and your reporting and then you put it out there and you have no idea who's going to really, enjoy the book or who it's going to really speak to. And the groups I've heard from most are women. So it has this huge feminist following, which is funny and interesting. Um, and people who work in tech who feel like this idea of ownership of ideas and um, it really speaks to them, which has been two totally unintended groups. How that, long copyright should go on. And right, that. right. And I mean, these things, I mean, it seems silly because board games are kind of this antiquated thing to a lot of people, but like a lot of these themes just keep coming up over and over again. Uh, well, you know, you've covered uh, Wall Street and the financial industry. Uh, as well as uh, sports mm -hmm. is a big beat for you now. Right. But uh, there was a period when f finance and Wall Street went from being like, oh, you invest in a company and you decide who's right. going to be a good investment long term and you help them build. Now it's a game. It feels right. Like you know, game. and I actually heard from a group, I'm going to get their website wrong, but um, somebody contacted me. It was before the book had come out, but they knew I was working on it. And it was a group of people who played the game. I think they all went to, I want to say Stanford or Wharton, a really great school and they would play with modern rules so like securitizing or <laughs> like you know they, they which is you know much more realistic um there's no in monopoly you know today there's very little um bundling of mortgages but i don't see why why not um and there actually are versions of the game where they use credit cards they use modern corporate brands and um, if you talk to people in games, they think that's like sacrilegious to change things. Um, but <laughs> there you have it. Mediterranean Avenue is a triple A rated investment. Right, 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 right. Yeah. And I'm, yeah, there's no CDOs, no, um, no contemporary, there's no investment banks I'm aware of in Monopoly, but Hey, maybe that's just the next incarnation. Who knows? So what's uh, your sports? You say you're doing more long form narrative stuff. Mm -hmm. but were there sports you grew up that you're excited by or that you loved or you played? You know, what's so funny is I, I grew up in Oregon. So I grew up around a lot of college football and a lot of track, which um, Eugene, where I was born, is like a huge track mecca. It's where Nike was founded. Steve Prefontaine is, you know, this kind of the James Dean of the sport. Um, and I am actually terribly coordinated. I had a really bad experience with sports growing up. I wasn't good at them. I was awkward. And I now I love running. <laughs> yeah. And so the idea that I write about sports is so funny to me because, and I do a lot more like investigative -y work. So to me, sports is an excuse to write about gender and race and politics and money and themes that I'm more interested in. So um, approaching it as not a diehard fan has actually been kind of an interesting way to view things. Um, it's To me, being a sports reporter, it's often more like being a religion reporter, mm -hmm. where you're writing about things that are really sensitive to people, that people are really passionate about, they really <laughs> care about, but also really matter. I mean, if you think about stadium construction, right? I mean, I live right by Barclays. That's had a huge impact on you know this neighborhood. Um, those things are very interested, uh, interesting to me. Have you sat, and well, you cover tennis a fair bit. Yes. Have you sat in Arthur Ashe in the upper level? Not in the yes, yes, I have. I've, I've done the, the rounds at Ash, and um, and I love tennis. But tennis is a great example of a sport I love to watch. I love to report on. I am a terrible tennis player. We should I'm play for terrible. Money. Like you would never want to play me in tennis. But I, I think Arthur Ashe is literally like the worst right. tennis stadium in the world. And it's going to get a roof. I mean, it's huge. Well, um, they're, just, they're, <laughs> they're complete idiots. I mean, I mean that, that is such a boondoggle, but they really should tear it down. It's literally a horrible place to watch tennis unless yeah. you're way down low. Yeah. That's why it's so noisy. Well, I love the side courts at the open. I think Which that they're that... getting rid of. They're getting rid of the funky court. They're getting rid right. of the funky, uh, you know, Louis, uh, Louis and the one next to it, court 13. But I'm talking about even the further, like the practice courts, because oh, yeah. what's great about that is you can see, you know, a Federer and the doll, the Williams is like just warming up and you get access to athletes in a way that in pro sports you often don't get. Mm -hmm. And I think as a journalist, you take it for granted because you talk to these people, you talk to their agents, you talk to their coaches, 
Um, but to me, the magic, what I love about tennis is it's so intense. And I think when you're sitting up in the nosebleeds, it's hard to kind of really get into the psychology and the intensity of a really great match. Because you, know, you can't see it. <laughs> right, right. You literally can't tell right. if it's a drop shot or going to hit the back. And down. honestly, I have a hard time watching football in a stadium for the same reason. And oh, yeah. I mean, I always think of football as like standing there with my dad and my brother in the cold and the rain and not being able to see it. And I actually think football on television is way more dynamic because you can you can pause, you can see, you, you know, you can see the whole field and also you're not cold and miserable. Um, so yeah, but that said, I think the ambiance of a baseball park is fantastic. Like I love baseball games. I think it's like a whole, it's a great way to spend an afternoon. Um, but, but yeah, it, it, the trade off between, you know, great spectator sports and TV sports and writing about them is like a very, it ends up being very complicated, <laughs> at least for me. So you said you weren't chomping at the bit to write a book and now you have, and that's exciting and it's out there in the world. You want to see how successful it'll be, but are you like, yeah, no. I think I'm going to want to do another You know, one. I was talking to my editor at this. I feel like when people ask about your second book when you're on book tour, you feel like you're like a wounded soldier the on the face. battlefield and you're like, God, you're asking me to get up and go again. Um, you know, I think to do a book, you have to be obsessed with your topic mm -hmm. in a way that you, um, you don't necessarily have to be with even an article because an article's lifespan. I mean, like a book is something you have to wake up with on a Saturday morning and be really excited about seeing. And you have to be excited about having nightmares about it. And be, you have to be really into it. And what I loved about this project is it was so broad that if I was really tired of writing about Ralph, I could go into Lizzie's world for a bit. If I was tired of that, I could go into the Parker brother history. I could kind of go around a little bit. So I think if I found another topic that I was like really in love with or just totally got obsessed with in the same way, Absolutely, but I think that you want, I'd rather take a while and think about what my next adventure is than, and get it right than just dive into something because it's kind of the next thing. Of course, your publisher is Bloomsbury USA. Yes. They're located in the Flatiron building. They since moved offices, but when I signed the deal, yes, they were in the Flatiron, which, how appropriate is which that? felt magical because that's where the Darrow, Barton, Parker deal happened. I felt <laughs> like that was a very serendipitous moment. When he went there and lied, essentially, <laughs> about how he invented the game because they needed right. him to say that officially. Right. Uh, that was in the Flatiron building, right, where you decided The Parker showroom was there for years. I think now it's like a Verizon or a Sprint store or something. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and then and when I went into the Bloomsbury offices, I told them, I was like, this is so, this feels right. You know, this is great. And so I'm thrilled that, you know, and they've been great to work with. I think that as an author, you hear so many horror stories about publishers and the book process and, you know, they've been fantastic. So I, I, I got very fortunate in a lot of um, elements of this. You know, I think that, you know, you kind of, it's easy to whine and say, oh, I spent five years on a book and it was crazy and it took forever. But there were a lot of, you know, great you know, guardian angels of the project for sure. And finally, Lizzie invented the landlord game. Yes. So we have to ask, do you rent or do you own? I bought, I became a oh. property owner while doing this project. And wow. it was really, it was very ironic and it was very funny. And I actually, um, like a lot of people, and I, I lived in over a dozen apartments in 10 years. I think as a journalist, you live all you over the place. Yeah, lot. and when I um, was finishing the book, and the darkest part for me of the whole process was when I was like, wrapping it up when you realize your deadline is coming and you can't make more changes and you're fact checking and you're just going nuts and I was living out of like 10 boxes in a sublet in the village and I was just like my life is like going off the rails and a lot of those boxes were like documents for the you know the book and I was looking and looking and looking and this apartment I actually got um I walked in and I was like this is this is my place and I wrote a letter about Virginia Woolf and a room of one's own because I felt like I was working on this project and I needed a room of my own like I didn't have a, like and wherever I lived I would have like note cards taped up where I was structuring the book mm -hmm. and like so it was just taking and so this space ended up being like actually a wonderful place to finish the book so now and now my friends joke about me having purchased real estate with monopoly money which is like <laughs> very funny but not entirely true either so um i did become a property owner wow which is very ironic and funny and if you sublet you'll be the landlord <laughs> yeah exactly exactly but i won't jack up the rent i hope not <laughs> well thanks very much for taking